Okay, uh, cool. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, I'm going to preface this by saying I like wrote this talk on the plane and it's still very, very early in my head, uh, so my thoughts may not be entirely together. Um, my name's Richo. Uh, I actually have a slide just on how to pronounce it because people always screw it up, uh, but Ben took care of that for me, which is awesome. Um, I'm a security engineer at Stripe uh, who kindly flew me out here. Um, we do credit card stuff. Ask me about that if you care. Uh, Full disclosure, I actually didn't write this tool. Um, my, my pal Snare wrote it, um, but he writes rootkits, and as a result, writes like pretty horrible Python, and then he's going to see this and get mad at me. Uh, so I rewrote it, and then in doing so, like learned a bunch of exciting stuff about debuggers. Um, and so I'm here to talk partially about the stuff that I wrote, but partially just about the, the, the tool in general. Um, a little bit of background about me. I'm a duck enthusiast. I'm from Melbourne. Uh, these days, I live in SF. I used to reverse engineer .NET. Uh, then I built infrastructure for a while, now I'm back working on the blue team. Um, cool, let's get on with it. Um, so like, why would you open a debugger in the first place? Um, just out of curiosity, like, how many people here are already like binary magicians like Rob Saucer is? No one, awesome. So no one's gonna hate this talk completely. How many people have done like any binary exploitation whatsoever? Okay, awesome. There's like a lot of middle ground, which is kind of my, my target audience. Um, so there are like two main types of debugger. You've got static, static debuggers, which are more commonly known as binary analysis frameworks, or a dynamic debugger, which loads up a process and lets you kind of like poke at its guts while it's going. Um, and so uh, the tool I'm here to talk to today, Voltron, is a plugin for a, di a dynamic debugger. Um, and the, the two main reasons that you would want to do this in the first place is uh, finding bugs in the case where you wrote an application or you're using an application. You have its source code, but it's misbehaving, and so you want to like poke at it in order to find out why it's doing the wrong thing, or you're interested in finding bugs in that you want to write a third-party binary plugin for someone else's app. Uh, the trick, though, is that debugging is basically sort of hard. Um, I'm sorry, the, the projector is a little bit smaller than I thought it was going to be, so reading some of these is going to suck. Don't, don't actually worry about the content. Um, so <laughs> that came out anyway. So. <laughs> Moving hastily along, uh, I, I know how many people actually recognize this. Uh, this guy, Fractal G, has done a, a bunch of like really exciting mock stuff uh, over the years, and so he wrote this amazing, amazing GDB in it, uh, and he uses the handle GDB in it all over the place because he's more famous for that than anything else. Uh, and so it's this like enormous sketchy script that you like sideload into GDB, uh, and it gives you this like fantastic display every time you stop the debugger. So you've got like a dump of the stack memory, the registers and then like a disassembly of the next few instructions after the instruction pointer. And that's really great, but it's flaky as shit. Uh, so much so that when I, so I wanted to get this screenshot, uh, so I downloaded his GDB in it, and I like booted my machine that I like do a bunch of reversing on, but is basically untouched. And so I loaded it into GDB, and it failed with some bizarre error, like couldn't extract EIP, which seems unlikely because it's like one of the more trivial tasks uh, to the point where I actually had to Google and find this on the internet because I couldn't get it working in time. Um, so the, the moral of this story is basically like stop hitting yourself. Uh, like debugging itself is already really difficult. Uh, like arbitrarily hamstringing yourself with like bad tools is just making it even more difficult than it needs to be. Uh, there's a reason that IDEs have really shiny point and click interfaces. Like I'm, I'm a huge fan of like the CLI in general. I find it much easier to interact with text and I don't have to like poke at a mouse. Uh, but for something as visual as trying to inspect the guts of a running process, like point and click is super nice. Um, and like for, for anyone who's like going to ask about DDD in, in the Q&A after this, like have you actually used it? Uh, but so with that said, like so this is LDB out of the box, right? You like load up a process, you set a breakpoint, you stop. It's like, it's good. It's better than GDB in the sense that the instruction set sort of makes sense, like the, the CLI is at least sort of coherent and well segregated, but it's still exceedingly difficult to use, especially if you're gonna have a debugger session alive for like days at a time. Uh, and so this screenshot that you absolutely can't decode, but I'm gonna kind of like point at the different parts of it is uh, a, a really simple setup with Voltron. Uh, and so the, the splits up here are just Tmux panes. Uh, so in the top left is the LLDB session itself, and then each of the other panes is a third party plugin that uh, actually writes to the inferior over a Unix domain socket. Uh, and so the rationale for this is basically that 
instead of desperately trying to like shove everything you want inside of the main process, you can split out what you want and add and remove pieces as you see fit. Uh, which, if nothing else, has the enormous advantage that if you've been in a debugger session for two days and you suddenly realize, oh shit, I need this extra piece of context, this is an actual problem I've had with GDB where I stopped to think for about an hour about whether or not I was willing to risk crashing GDB by adding features to it. Uh, and so under the hood, Voltron sort of looks like this. Uh, there is a core, which is basically like a tiny I.O. kernel, uh, which you load directly into the debugger itself. And so it's responsible for poking at the inferior. It exposes a very simple API uh, and then listens on a Unix domain socket. Uh, and so what that gives you is the ability to run all of the fiddly code that actually does stuff in separate processes, meaning that if they crash, you don't take your debugger session out with them. Uh, and it also means that the code running inside of the debugger can have, I wouldn't go as far as to say test coverage, but like there are some tests. Um, you can have reasonable confidence that if you, if you add more stuff, it won't break. And at the very least, you, you have like a firm interface boundary. So you can at least reason about the system. Um, and so I, I want to talk a little bit about like the various things that Voltron gives you and then I'm pretty sure we'll have time so I'm going to actually go through an example of an exploiting a really stupid binary that I wrote on the plane. Um, and so the, the first one is the register view and this is like the most obvious thing uh, if you've spent any time inside of a binary uh, no, knowing what's going on like inside the registers and particularly being able to see what's changed as you step over instructions is probably the most piece of valuable, the most valuable piece of context you can have. Uh, I spend so much time typing reg info into LDB or re uh, reg read into GDB because they're swapped and then getting mad at myself. Uh, this completely dodges that problem. Uh, and so the important thing to note is that uh, a few of these are lit up in gray. Uh, they're actually the not applicable ones in the screenshot. But as you step over, everything that hasn't changed uh, turns to gray. So if you're just like you hit S and then leaning on enter to like skip over a big section you don't care about, you can actually see the registers changing in real time because everything red is new. Uh, and so the second... Uh, plugin that you, you sort of like really are interested in is the stack view. Uh, <laughs> the, I love ducks. Uh, <laughs> so th this is what the stack view looks like. And unfortunately, uh, I was trying to put this together. Um, one of the key things that uh, we sort of optimized for when we were writing this thing was information density, uh, which doesn't translate super well to uh, A, big fonts or B, projectors. Uh, but we'll try and get through it. Um, but so this is basically just uh, a, a view of the stack uh, which grows uh, upwards in, in memory uh, and uh, in the same way so does this. So as, as, you write, uh, as you write data into the stack, you'll actually see it going up, not down the screen as you might expect. Uh, and then hopefully as of a couple of weeks ago, the, the stack view now dereferences any pointers that it finds. Uh, so if you have pointers to functions, it'll annotate them. You, you can't really read it, but it says start for the first two, which is the entry point of the binary, and then say hi, which is a function pointer. Uh, and it'll also dereference any strings that it finds. So you can like quickly skim over what you're looking at. Uh, and the, the last one I'm going to talk about before we kind of get into the demo is the disassembly view, uh, which is like exactly what you would expect it to be, uh, except that it always uses Intel syntax because at and is awful. Uh, and it also syntax highlights and, and, and does a little bit of annotation uh, that LDB can't quite do on its own. Um, so with all that said, uh, let's try and work through an example. Um, I'm pretty curious how this is going to go, both because of the, the size of the projector and kind of the scope, and I didn't sacrifice any beers to the demo gods last night, but let's give it a shot. This, can I, this can go away, or maybe it can't. Okay. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> uh, tell you what, let's just like <laughs> we're definitely not going to run out of space. This is going to be just fine. <laughs> cool. Uh, um, so I, I've got this victim binary that I generated last night. Uh, it's it's pretty straightforward. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do before we sort of jump into it is just have a, have a look over the playing field. Um, so we've got these three main functions. Um, we've got main, which is the entry point of the function. Uh, and I'm, th like, this is not meant to be a workshop in binary exploitation, so I'm just going to kind of like point at some stuff. Uh, feel free to ask me questions as I go along. 
um, if, I'm, if I'm being excessively hand wavy. Uh, but so the, the most important thing to note immediately is that uh, when, when it lights up, it's creating uh, 160 bytes of room on the stack. Uh, there is this call to read, and its, second, uh, its third argument is 4K. Um, so there might be an overflow. Uh, who, who really knows there? Um, <laughs> and there, there's this function pointer to say hi that subsequently gets loaded into RSI. Uh, and down here, we, we make a call to RSI. Um, so there's kind of like, the, the, the bug here is basically that we allocate this enormous buffer on the stack that we're planning on reading some, some bytes from standard into, uh, and then there's a function pointer after it, and then we're gonna call that function pointer with the, the buffer that we potentially overflowed. Uh, and so if you look up in memory, there's this say hi function, which is basically a shim around uh, printf, uh, and this unsafe run, run function that some idiot left in this thing specifically so that we could exploit it even, uh, which is basically just a, a, a shim for system. Uh, so who knows, if we put some kind of like shell command in the thing, it might get executed. Um, and so the first thing I'm gonna do is uh, just grab this address of unsafe run, because some idiot also built this without ASLR. Um, so happily, it's gonna be super trivial to, to exploit. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna load up the victim in LDB. Can everyone like read this so far? Cool, and so... <laughs> I, li I genuinely didn't hear, what, sorry? Can or can't? Oh. Is this any better? This is gonna be super exciting. Are we are we in the ballpark? Kinda? Yeah? 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 Alright. I have no idea if Voltron even works in the terminal this small. This is gonna be exciting. Uh, <laughs> So first of all, we've, we've like got our debugger set up. Um, uh, like Voltron kind of does some starting because of the, the in, internals of debugger, you have to load up the, the inferior before you uh, actually start it. So we'll Voltron init, uh, break on main, and then run the process. And so the next thing that we're gonna do is if you do Voltron view reg, you get a view of the registers. And like I said, as you step over instructions in it, the, the, the uh, the registers that have changed changed in real time. Uh, and so what we're gonna do for this one, I'm actually having to change this pretty drastically because I thought I was gonna have a bunch more real estate. Um, so what we'll do is uh, we'll load up the stack view this time. Oops. Um, yeah. I'll uh, tell you what, let's instead... Okay, so we, we have like a view of the stack in our currently running inferior, and let's uh, set up a breakpoint on our uh, read function that we like already know is called um, from having had a look at the disassembly. Uh, we'll continue to it, and then we'll jump into this syscall. So it's now looking for uh, like some bytes from standard in to look at. So we'll say like hi besides to. Uh, and now if we have a look at the stack view, uh, you can see that that memory, that uh, string is now like appearing on the stack. Um, and specifically, we can see that it's appearing at a known location. Uh, and then, unfortunately, it's like a little bit difficult to read just because of the small size. Uh, but if you look up here, you'll see that uh, they, this uh, address here is the address of a function, a function in memory that the debugger has helpfully annotated for us. Um, and so just trivially looking at this, we can see that if we were to uh, write a much longer string here, uh, it, it may even run all the way up the stack and subsequently trample all over this, this function pointer here. Um, and so we can verify this like interactively. Um, so we're gonna start the binary over. Uh, we're gonna, actually we still have the breakpoint on read. Um, so we'll continue to read. Uh, and this time, instead of putting a few bytes in, we're gonna just trample all over the stack with like a jillion A's. Uh, and so now uh, we can see that we've completely obliterated the stack frame, including that function pointer. So when we continue the program again, uh, we can see that we're actually faulting on this call RSI. Uh, so we, we've got like a bad access, and specifically if we have another look at the register view, uh, we can see that RSI is equal to 41, 41, 41, 41, 41, uh, at which point you like post this to bug track and get mad lols, because some idiot built a like hilariously exploitable binary with no ASLR. Um, 
The next thing I want to show is going to be like a little bit hand wavy, uh, and I'm, I'm sort of hoping that people will appreciate the utility of this because it's probably the most call your own, like choose your own adventure YOLO thing I've ever written to plug into Voltron. Uh, but so let's start this thing again. Um, uh, we'll begin again, we'll like run up until read. Uh, once again, we'll step into the syscall and then we'll say like hi besides toe again. And now let's like step back out into the main function. Uh, and so what we're gonna do is uh, a separate tool, which I, I'll post the link to. Um, the, the way it works is not super interesting right now, uh, but so you have Calculon console, which is basically, oh boy, that does not work well at all in a tiny thing. That's fine. Uh, but, but so, um, yeah, I, what it does is, it, it's like a programmer's calculator, right? So it'll like show you the, the, the current value in the REPL formatted a bunch of different ways, which is just really helpful if you're doing point arithmetic. The display doesn't matter right now. Uh, what does matter is this magic V object. Uh, so you have this Voltron proxy object inside of the REPL. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to see what the current value of rep is, uh, you could do this. Uh, and so like, if you wanted to take a look at, uh, say, all the memory in the stack uh, in the current stack frame, uh, you can like dump memory as a as an array of bytes into a Python REPL. Uh, and so if we flip through here, the string hi besides to really should be in it. Um, there it is. Um, and, and so what this does is give you enormous flexibility to in, instead of copying pasting values between a debugger and a REPL, like I did for a really long time. Uh, like, sorry, can everyone hear? Uh, like literally going as far as to generate like massive Rube Goldberg machines just for the purposes of like, given that I have this inferior and I'm interested in like this stuff, like format it in such a way that it will be like copy and paste to REPL friendly. Uh, like wrapping it with the appropriate like parser and, and struct unpack invocations so that I could like use the tmux paste buffer to like shove things into the REPL. Uh, instead, what I can do is uh, use the awesome struct module in Python uh, that we're, we're gonna write an exploit for this because why the fuck not? Um, but so uh, you can use the struct module to like define the layout, like d define the structure of objects in memory and then literally just like pull them out of your inferior using the same language that you would use to poke at it from inside of the debugger. Uh, and that gives you enormous flexibility. Like all of the other plugins for Voltron give you visibility but like no real ability to like actually poke. Right, like all it does is show you stuff. Uh, whereas uh, the Calculon integration gives you the ability to actually like fuck with the binary in real time from a tool that you're already really familiar with. Is everyone with me so far? Does, do people have questions about kind of what I've covered in that section? Did this whiz over any heads or am I, am I an idiot? <laughs> Both, awesome. All right, let's write an exploit. So uh, we have, <coughs> So we, we know for a fact that we uh, have a function pointer at a known address. Uh, we have a stack overflow, uh, sorry, we have a buffer overflow and we don't really care if we crash the process afterwards. Uh, so let's not name the file the same as the exploit I already wrote because that would be too easy. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, uh, and then because we're doing this like in the quickest, <laughs> stop. Quickest, dirtiest way possible, uh, we'll have our command, which will be sys.rg1, uh, and so we'll add a null byte to the end of this, uh, because otherwise system will buff because it'll read into arbitrary memory and then fault. Uh, and then so we already saw um, when we were looking at the stack that all of these pointers need to be word aligned, right? Uh, if, if we start scribbling pointers all over the stack but they don't begin at the beginning of a machine word, it's not gonna be able to dereference them, and again, we'll, we'll fault and have a bad time because we won't get code exact. Uh, so our padding needs to be uh, aligned to eight bytes and then we're gonna subtract the length of the command mod eight. Uh, and so we're just gonna put the letter A because it's really easy to see in a stack frame. Uh, and then so our injection <coughs> is just going to be our command plus our padding and then we're going to pause, <coughs> sorry. Uh, so then we've got our function address. Uh, and I don't know if anyone's ever tried to parse a hex literal in Python. There's probably a better way to do this. Uh, but this is super easy, so we're gonna do this. Uh, and then, so we're, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna pack our uh, function pointer as a, um, 
little endian q word, which is the, the word, word length on this machine of our func address. And then we're gonna write like a jillion of them all over the stack. Um, and then we just print our injection. Is everyone with me so far on, on what that all meant? Do you want me to go over it again? Okay. So we now have our injection. Uh, I, I talked through that example, but I haven't known one because like, I don't like to tempt the demo gods more than I have to. Uh, so we're gonna write the contents of this out to the exploit. In fact, first of all, let's, uh, let's just check that it works. So we're gonna run ID uh, if we break on unsafe run. It'll give us the address of it. Um, so this is the, the address in memory that we wanna jump to basically. Uh, and then we're gonna run our vector process with it. Cool, and so we executed the ID function with system. Hooray, code exec really easily. Um, what's more interesting is like given that we now have this, uh, we can write it out to a, fi a file that we'll call exploit, um, kello debugger and start over. So we'll break on main, uh, but this time when we run it, we'll pass a file to stand it in. Okay, so we're now broken on main. Cool. Uh, and so we're gonna do the exact same thing we did before, uh, in that we're going to open up the register view, if I can type, uh, and then we're gonna open up the stack view over here. Uh, and so this time, if we break on read, uh, run through, and then execute the syscall, this time it doesn't block because we've already hooked a, hooked a file up to stand in at the process basically. Uh, but now, if we have a look at what the stack looks like, uh, it, it's done basically what we thought we would. Voltron has very helpfully uh, told us that uh, if, if this was expanding properly, uh, we have this string ID, which is null terminated. We have our A's, which is the padding we wanted to write. And then we've just like scribbled function pointers to our unsafe run function all the way up the stack. Uh, and so as a result, if we keep stepping over this, uh, let's step out of read, uh, step through our main function, Sorry, excitingly, since the rewrite, sometimes the, the views take a little while to update, sometimes they don't update at all. I've had good success with just killing it and starting over. Uh, that could be it. Uh, and so as we step over it now, we can see the values changing. Uh, the most relevant thing here is that uh, as, as it's loaded um, our pointer into memory, we now see that RSI is our function pointer that we, that we wanted before. Uh, and so when we step in to call RSI, we get code exec and, and our ID. Um, so, so the basic gist here is, is not to uh, give a, a, a kind of long-winded talk about binary exploitation, but it, it's about looking at the, looking at the tools and, and peeling layers off of them. Uh, and so when, when we wrote this tool, uh, I actually knew nothing about binary exploitation when I first picked it up. Uh, I just had a lot of background as a Python dev. Uh, I, I wanted to find ways to elucidate what you're looking at. Right, like in, instead of having the, the binary be sort of this like magic black box and you know like something, something memory, something, something machine registers, something, something segments. I, I wanted to be able to like actually look at and see what I was doing. And particularly like with, with a big background in development and like a nominal background in security, uh, I, I already like knew how to write Python and I knew how to like interact with the CLI. Uh, so I, I wanted to like bring all of this side over to like familiar tools that like if you have a background in software development you might be experienced with. Um, and, and so like the takeaway here is basically like pull stuff up in this. Uh, like to give a canonical example, has everyone used like the, the newer two versions of OS X that if you like type git or clang without the dev tools installed, it pops up the dialog saying like you tried to use the dev tools, would you like to install them? Um, so like a last job that I worked at, uh, one of our devs like did that and kind of out loud was just like, how does this work? And like, we, we went through it, like we, we used the exact tools and processes that I just showed you. Uh, instead of being like, oh, something, something magic, oh, you can detrust it and like see that it does something, something, X select, X select. like that, that's not a satisfying answer and it doesn't actually teach you anything about the system. Instead, like we opened it up and then just like stepped through the process very interactively and saw what it was doing. Uh, and then as a result, it was possible to like write a plugin to do something smarter for our specific workflow. Uh, and he had no background in security, like had never written a compiled language before. Um, but in the space of like an hour, I was able to show him like how to pull apart a process. Um, I think I'm getting precariously close to running out of time. Uh, the only slide I have left is the resources and shit, uh, which you may be interested in. 
Um, <laughs> so <laughs> given, given that we have like two minutes, I guess, are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, there's also Radar2. Um, so like, there are a bunch of uh, dynamic debuggers now. Uh, there's Radar2 uh, for Windows, there's Ollie, there's Windbag if you really hate yourself. Um, there, there are like a bunch of really good debuggers. The, the real trick with this um, is that it's not intended to be a thing that you pick up and it just immediately works. Uh, and that's not always what you want, uh, particularly if you're uh, diving into this, like maybe you do want a thing that pops up. One thing I found though, uh, so I, to, to clarify this, when I say that I'd never done binary exploitation before, when I was 12, I like put, I dropped a lot of binaries into Ollie, and I like clicked a lot of buttons, uh, but I never really knew what I was doing. And a part of that is because like Ollie or like Immunity Debugger or like Radar are all kind of geared towards people who already know how a computer works. Uh, and if, as long as you have that context, that's fantastic. Like you can manipulate the tool very simply. Um, but like LDB at its core has like. <laughs> I, I would say that it w doesn't like overload the user with options, which is to say that it gives them like no help whatsoever. Um, but, but so the beauty of this tool is A, that if you know exactly what it is that you want, uh, I, I have a TMUX script that like manipulates a lot of panes and kind of like builds the environment that I feel really comfortable working in. And that's the, the teeny tiny screenshot that no one could possibly have read uh, was what, what my environment looks like when I'm like debugging something. Um, but in the general case, like, I, I don't think this is better, or, better than or worse than more integrated solutions. I think it's orders of magnitude more flexible than. Um, and so if that's what you're looking for, this is probably like, at least worth checking out. Right. Cool. <laughs>